Welcome everyone to this jubilant festival gathering where we honor Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. Please open up your Haggadahs to page 34 as we commence our Seder meal. The Haggadahs we use for this is called Grace at the Table. You can find it on Amazon. Don't worry, if you don't have a copy of this, you can still follow along just as well. We'll put our responsive unison uh, readings together on the screens to follow along. So here we stand, some 3,500 years distant from the Jews' inaugural Passover meal. Yet, we are called to recollect the profound love of God, who withheld not his own son, but offered him up as our Passover lamb. Just as the blood of the lamb once marked the doorpost of the Israelites' homes, so too has the blood of Christ been applied to our lives. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1, 7. As the angel of death once bypassed their dwellings, we too have transitioned from death to life, John 5, 24. For as the angel of death passes over us, we shall not face death's sting, John 8, 51. For we possess everlasting life, John 3, 16. We say amen to that. Now, what may be less known about the Passover is its designation as an eight-day festival, also recognized as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. God ordained this celebration in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. This is a day you are to commemorate, referring to the Passover, for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. It's essential to acknowledge that what we're about to partake in cannot be compared to a conventional Passover meal as Jesus changed it all for us during the Lord's Supper. However, we will incorporate many traditional elements. You may have heard the Passover meal referred to as a Seder meal and wonder why. Seder means order of service, which, which aptly describes the structure of a Passover meal. Through this feast, we engage in worshiping God. Did you know that Passover is not a Hebrew word? This might surprise you. The Hebrew term for Passover, Pesach, derives from the Egyptian word, Pash, meaning to spread wings over. The Lord's Passover signifies finding shelter and protection under the outstretched wings of the Almighty. It's no wonder the psalmist who likely participated in the Pesach meal annually penned the following words in Psalm 91, verses 1 through 4. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. In a traditional Passover Seder meal, typically two candles are lit and they are placed at the center of the table. The lighting of the candle separates the sacred from the mundane. Now, in keeping with the Passover tradition, we will now light these candles. Their flame reminds us of God's love shining in Christ, the light of the world, and His light in our lives. Glory to our God, our Heavenly Father, for you have set us apart by your grace. You have called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. 
We light these candles, acknowledging you as the giver and sustainer of all life. Thank you, Father, for the promise in your word that we have your favor in Christ forever. Our restored relationship with you radiantly brightens our homes, enriches our lives, causes us to bear forth fruit in the world. We thank you that you have given us the light of life and we will never walk in darkness. Amen. In a traditional Seder meal, four cups of wine are drunk. Some elect to use grape juice instead. The first cup right here represents the promise that God made to the Israelites. I will bring you out. Would you like to know what the first cup is called? Tell us about the first cup that we drink from. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification and blessing, and it speaks of God's grace, rescuing his people from all that held them captive. As we drink, we set this occasion apart as something special, a moment consecrated to God in grateful response to Jesus, redeeming us from everything that once enslaved us. For this cup, Lord, and all it symbolizes, we give you praise. So as we drink from our cups, we're going to recline on our left side, which symbolizes our God-given freedom. Before breaking bread at Passover, it was customary to wash one's hands, thus ensuring ritual purity. Before he broke bread, Jesus went one step further, washing not hands, but feet. And not his own, but all the disciples, including Peter, whom he knew would deny him three times. Today, we symbolically wash the dustiness from the world off our feet as we wash in the Word of God. Celebrating Passover as God ordained is the perfect way for us to remember that our Passover lamb, Jesus, and his sacrifice is the basis of our freedom from any and every bondage. One of the many symbolic foods eaten at Passover is what the Jews called carpus. In other words, a green vegetable, traditionally parsley. Tell us why we eat this. Alongside the promise of springtime. However, we have another symbol. It is the salty water. It recalls the tears that were shed by the people of Israel as they suffered in Egypt. They were tears of pain, sorrow, and despair. We are reminded that alongside joy, life brings sadness. Alongside spring, winter. In joy or sorrow, pleasure or pain, the Lord is with us. Glory be to God, who works all things together for our good. Let's all take the parsley and dip it in the salt water and eat. In the next part of our Seder, we'll make use of another symbol, unleavened bread. In the next part, 
Three pieces of matzah are enclosed within a pouch. These matzah symbolize the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And just as Isaac, the second or middle patriarch, was the sole one taken out for sacrifice in Genesis 22, similarly, only the middle slice of matzah is removed. Isaac, the promised son, foreshadowed Jesus, the promised Messiah and Son of God, who was sacrificed. Why use unleavened rather than leavened bread? Traditionally known as the bread of affliction, it serves as a reminder of the haste with which the Israelites departed Egypt. Exodus 12, 39 recounts how they used the dough they had brought from Egypt to bake unleavened bread as there was insufficient time to add yeast during their flight or to prepare any other provisions. Three pieces are utilized in total, two symbolizing those placed in the temple at Jerusalem during the festival, and the third is positioned between the others, being broken in half during the meal. The Hebrew term matzo, unleavened, denotes sweetness without sourness. This unleavened bread symbolizes the purity and wholesomeness of a life free from sin. It signifies the sin-cleansed life that Jesus embodies as the Lamb of God who absolves the world's sins. For those who hunger and seek spiritual fulfillment, Jesus Christ, the bread of life, provides satisfaction. Through his Son, God has redeemed us. Jesus declared, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is traditional within the Passover meal to hide part of the broken bread known as the ophikomen. Young children have the chance to find it later and win a prize. What is the meaning of this? Some suggest that this practice symbolizes the Jews' expectation of the coming Messiah. As New Testament believers, we shall see later the much deeper symbolism here. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh day must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do not work at all on any of these days except to prepare, prepare food for anyone to eat. This is all you may do. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month you are to eat bread made without yeast. From the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days no yeast is to be found in your houses. And anyone, whether foreigner or native born, who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families 
and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Only these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites of Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. Children play a vital role in the Passover celebration as the Seder provides an opportunity for them to learn about God's redemptive nature. Therefore, it is customary for the children to ask the four traditional questions during the Seder, seeking to understand the significance of Passover and its teachings. Why is this night different from all the other nights? Once the Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord in his goodness and mercy redeemed them from that land with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Had he not redeemed us, surely we would all still be enslaved. On all other nights we eat either leavened or unleavened bread. On this night, why do we eat only unleavened bread? We eat the unleavened bread to remember that the sons of Israel, in their haste to leave Egypt, had to take their bread with them while it was still flat. On all other nights, we eat herbs of every kind. On this night, why do we eat only bitter herbs? We eat bitter herbs to remember how bitter it was to be enslaved. On all other nights, we don't dip the vegetables. On this night, why do we dip them twice? Why is this night so special? By dipping, we remember that a life of bondage is bitter indeed, but that even the harshest bondage is sweetened by the promise of redemption. This night is truly special, for once the Israelites were slaves, but now they are free. So we recline to appropriate and appreciate the rest God has given us in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In gratitude, we worship God as we recount the story of the Passover. Had he not redeemed us, surely we would all still be enslaved. We begin our retelling of the Passover story with the four sons. Each son represents a different approach to learning and understanding our heritage. As we recite the descriptions of the four sons, let us reflect on their attitudes and consider how we can engage with our traditions and teachings. We will listen attentively and respond accordingly to each description. The wise son asks, What are the testimonies, the statues, and the laws which the Lord our God has commanded you? We respond with the story of the Exodus, for he seeks to learn and understand our traditions. The wicked son asks, what does this service mean to you? We answer firmly, to you and not to him, for he separates himself from the community and shows disdain for our customs. The simple son asks, what is this? We teach him simply and directly for he is naive 
and seeks basic information about our observance. The son who does not know how to ask, no question is asked. We engage him by teaching and guiding, for he may be too young or uninterested to ask questions. Just as we reflect on the attitudes of the four sons in the Passover Haggadah, let us also consider how Jesus used parables to teach about different responses to the message of the kingdom of God. We listen attentively, eager to draw parallels between the ancient tradition and the teachings of Jesus. In Matthew 13, verses 1 through 23, Jesus tells the parable of the sower, describing four types of soil, the path, rocky ground, thorny ground, and good soil. We recognize the significance of these four types of soil, representing varying receptivity to the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ. Each type of soil reflects a different condition of the heart, just as the four sons represent different attitudes toward learning and understanding. We see the connection between the ancient Passover narrative and the timeless teachings of Jesus, finding relevance in both for our spiritual journey. As we continue our Passover celebration, may we strive to cultivate hearts like the good soil, receptive to the message of the kingdom of God, and eager to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. During this part of the Seder, I will recite the ten plagues that afflicted the Egyptians as described in the book of Exodus. As each plague is recited, everyone will dip a finger into their wine or their juice and remove a drop onto their napkins, symbolizing the lessening of joy in response to the suffering of the Egyptians. The primary purpose of removing the drop of wine or juice is to symbolize empathy and solidarity with those who suffered during the plagues while also we are recognizing the complexities of the Exodus story, which include both liberation and the consequences of the plagues on the Egyptians. Blood. Frogs. Gnats or lice. Wild animals, pestilence, boils, hail and fire, locusts. Darkness, death of the firstborn, the recitation of the plague serve as a solemn reminder of the suffering endured by both Egyptians and the Israelites during the Exodus story as well as a demonstration of the power of God in delivering his people from slavery. As we prepare to partake in the festive meal, I cleanse my hands once again, symbolizing our readiness to enjoy this special occasion. As I wash, let us also wash away any distractions or worries, focusing instead on the joy of being together and the blessings of being in Christ, whose blood shed as our Passover lamb makes us pure before God.
our blessing over matzah. Glory be to God our Father, the maker of heaven and earth, the giver of every good gift. Glory to you, Lord, for providing us this bread and nourishment. Let's partake of our matzah bread together. The second cup, the cup of deliverance, is a symbol of joy, recalling God's deliverance of his people. But it's also a symbol of sorrow. For it reminds us of the misery brought into the world by human sinfulness, the suffering, evil, and tragedy endured by so many. These still as much a part of our world today as ever. This cup represents God's promise. I will deliver you. While there is still heartache and heartbreak in the world, our joy is found in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We celebrate what God has done, how he has given us new life. Once we were imprisoned by sin, but now the Son has set us free. We are free indeed. Look how the Lord has turned our sorrow into joy. Oh, what a Savior we have in Jesus Christ. We lift our prayers for those who do not yet know of the joy of the Lord. May the Holy Spirit use us to bring the salvation of the Lord unto those you bring along our paths. Amen. Let's drink from the second cup, reclining on our left side as we do. What does this bone symbolize? In the Old Testament, it represented the Passover lamb whose blood was applied to the doorpost of the home to cause the angel of death to pass over their homes. In Exodus 12, 46, the Israelites were instructed not to break any bones on the Passover lamb. Jesus, our sacrificial Passover lamb, did not have his bones broken either. John 19, 33. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. For us as Christians, the Passover lamb takes on a new significance in Jesus, the one whose blood was shed to bring us freedom and new life. We see in him the definitive sacrifice offered so that we might also become his people chosen, beloved, redeemed as children of God. For your grace, Lord, we thank you. An egg, does this have meaning too? This roasted egg, or beitza, symbolizes distress and despair, but also new beginnings. Having been roasted in fire, it represents all who have faced grief and mourning. Eggs also are a symbol of new life. They speak of our God who offers new life to us and to all. An egg being round and, and endless is like eternal life which we have in Jesus. Some interpretations suggest that the egg serves as a symbol of mourning for the destruction of the temple and the loss of sacrificial offerings. Its presence on the Seder plate reminds participants of the historical and spiritual significance of the temple and the need for spiritual restoration. The symbolism of the Beitza extends to Christian interpretations as well. In Christian theology, Jesus Christ is seen as fulfilling the role of the temple. Just as the temple in Jerusalem was a central place of worship and sacrifice for the Jewish people, Jesus became the new temple through his life, death, and resurrection. 
Therefore, in the context of the Passover Seder, the Beitza can also represent Jesus as the new temple. His sacrificial death and resurrection brought about a new way of worship and reconciliation with God, replacing the need for temple sacrifices. By including the Beitza on the Seder plate, participants are reminded of Jesus' role as the ultimate sacrifice and the source of spiritual restoration and renewal for believers. For your renewing power, Lord, we thank you. Let's take our egg and dip it in our salt water. You might notice that there is also horseradish on our Seder plates. Exodus 12.8 instructs us to eat bread with bitter herbs. Tell us what the herbs signify. Known by the Jews as maror, they represent the bitterness of life endured by the people of Israel under the Egyptian oppression. As the scripture, Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 tells us, the Egyptians ruthlessly imposed ever more demanding tasks upon the Israelites, forcing them to make bricks and work the field, their lives made bitter by hard labor. Also, the bitter herbs remind us of the bitterness of pain that Jesus endured so that we might live. We also have here a bowl of sweet paste known as haroset. Before we eat the herbs, we dip them briefly into a sweet mixture of fruit, nuts, wine, and spices. Tell us more about this mixture. The Jews call it haroset. Like the salty water, this paste speaks of hardship and sorrow. It represents the clay and straw that the Israelites used in Egypt to make bricks and mortar. Everyone takes horseradish and places some on the romaine lettuce. They will then dip the bitter herbs, romaine lettuce with horseradish, into the haro set immediately shaking off any residue so that its sweetness cannot hide the bitterness of the herbs. May the bitterness of these herbs help us to think of those for whom life is bitter today. May it inspire us, Lord, to reach out in love in your name. Let's partake of it together. We will take our matzah bread, break it into pieces to make a sandwich. Take a piece of your romaine lettuce, dip it into your horseradish, put it on one part of your matzah bread. Then take some of the sweet paste, the haro set. Also dip that in the horseradish as well. Place that on the other piece of your matzah bread. Put the two pieces together. This part of the meal speaks of the contrasting sides of life, joy and sorrow, hope and despair, wholeness and suffering, life and death. Despite whatever may come, God has given us victory in Jesus' name. We eat with thanksgiving to God our Father for the sweet victory we have in Jesus Christ over the bitter things we may experience. And then let's partake in it together, reclining on our left side as we do. It's not at the third cup that we come to know Jesus, but by the first two cups. At the first cup, the broken Ephekumen pictured that God would provide for our redemption. 
We could never redeem ourselves, but God alone would provide the lamb. So Messiah, the lamb of God, has been provided for our eternal redemption. At the second cup, we recognize that this lamb was not only to be slain, but that the blood had to be applied to the door. So the fact that Jesus was slain for our redemption does us no good unless the blood has been applied. By trusting in Jesus' sacrifice for us at the cross, we apply his blood by faith as an atonement on our heart's door. This is how we've come to the third cup, the place of remembering the relationship we have by faith in Jesus, the provision of God. We now fill the third cup, the cup of redemption. It celebrates God's deliverance of his people, both from the plague of death that struck the Egyptian firstborn and from their long years of slavery. For us as Christians, that deliverance comes definitively in Christ, who gave his life for ours. The third cup represents God's promise, I will redeem you. Lord, we thank you. We give glory to God for this cup, which celebrates the deliverance of your people. Amen. Let's drink from the third cup together, reclining as we do. At this point in a Seder meal, this is when the feast happens. So if you have uh, done some of the recipes in the Haggadah. Maybe you prepared the Jewish brisket, maybe gefilte fish as an appetizer. There's some other wonderful things that you could do, some matzo ball soup and, and others. You can feel free to pause the video at this time, enjoy the feast with your family, and then we'll pick it up from there. This is the part where everyone would have the meal together. The celebratory meal would be presented. It would feature those customary Passover delicacies, like I mentioned brisket, maybe roasted chicken, matzo ball soup, and other symbolic dishes. Though we are near the close of our Passover meal, you may have noticed that something is missing. Yes, what happened to the piece of bread that you broke off and wrapped earlier and placed in a bag? A child has hidden it. The other children will leave to find it and will be rewarded with the prize. Some say the missing piece of bread is a reminder that God has more wonderful things prepared for us to do. This also serves as a reminder that worship is a family occasion and should include joyous, fun moments. So we sent the children to take part together to search for the hidden afikomen. For us as Christians, this afikomen has special meaning, for it speaks above all of Christ. As this bread was hidden from view, so too Jesus' body was laid in a tomb and a stone rolled across the entrance. As bread has been found, so too Jesus' followers discovered the truth that Jesus is our risen Lord. There's still more to discover today, for though in Christ we see and we know God, our knowledge is still limited, and there is always more to learn, more to experience, more to be revealed. The children have returned. They have found the hidden afikumen, and so now we take it and we divide it again amongst all who are gathered at our meal. It's my prayer that we all may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit leads us to receive more of your love, deeper insight into your word, and to experience more of the abundant life Jesus died to give us. Amen.
Blessed are you, O God, our Father and provider, who generously supplies all our needs and sustains us with your abundant love and grace. We thank you for this meal, a symbol of your provision and the fellowship we share as members of your family. As we have partaken of this food, may it nourish our bodies and strengthen our spirits, reminding us of your constant presence and faithfulness in our lives. Just as you provided manna for the Israelites in the wilderness, so too you will provide for us each and every day. We are grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice on the cross has brought us into a new covenant relationship with you. As we remember your life, your death, and your resurrection, may we be filled with gratitude and joy, knowing that through you, we have received the ultimate blessing of salvation and eternal life. Help us to live lives of thanksgiving and service, sharing your love and grace with others, and bringing hope to a world in need. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. Your goodness and your mercy, they endure forever. Amen. At this point, we would give a prize to the children for finding the hidden nefikum in. Typically, kosher chocolate or even money is given as a reward. And so what we like to do here at Acts 433 Church is we actually give gold coins, uh, gold uh, kosher chocolate coins. It's a big hit even with our adults. They love to have that as well. So we actually share with both. Um, but it is a, a wonderful opportunity to see the joy of the kids going to look for the hidden of Fikumen, representing Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, and returning for a great reward. Because our great reward is Christ. And when we find him, we find success. We find the favor of God. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you his servants, praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. The fourth cup symbolizes thanksgiving and hope. As we pour the fourth cup, let us reflect on the abundance of blessings bestowed upon us and the hope that fills our hearts. This cup is a testament to our gratitude for all that God has accomplished in our lives and the anticipation of his continued guidance and provision. In drinking this cup, we remember the price that God paid to fulfill his promise. I will take you as my people, as he graciously gave us the life of his son. Glory to you, Lord. Let's drink from the fourth cup, reclining as we do. Why are there five cups of wine on the table if we only drink four of them? The fifth cup, known as the cup of Elijah, holds a special significance in our Passover Seder. This cup of wine is set out but left undrunk during the ceremony, placed typically between the Seder plate, named after the prophet Elijah, who is believed in Jewish tradition to announce the Messiah's arrival. The Elijah cup symbolizes hope and anticipation for redemption. We leave the Elijah cup untouched 
expressing our faith that Elijah will one day return to herald the coming of the Messiah and the ultimate redemption of the Jewish people. At a designated moment later in the Seder, we will open the door to welcome Elijah, signifying our hope for his arrival. This act is often accompanied by a song, representing our longing for the fulfillment of messianic prophecies. Our Elijah cup, it holds additional significance for us. It symbolizes the hope that many Jewish people will recognize Jesus as the Messiah upon Elijah's return. According to 2 Kings 2.11, Elijah was taken to heaven and will return during the tribulation period as described in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 11, Elijah appears as one of two witnesses, delivering a prophetic message before Christ's second coming. These witnesses prophesy for 1,260 days, just short of the three and a half years as foretold in Daniel 9.27. As believers, we poured a cup for Elijah as a reminder of our faith in God's plan for salvation for the Jewish people. Through the ch though the church will be raptured and not present on earth when Elijah returns, we trust in God's ultimate redemption of those elect who remain. Through the Elijah cup, we express our hope and belief in the fulfillment of God's promises. As we gather around the Seder table, we remember the promise of the prophet Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Malachi 4, 5. Elijah the prophet is a symbol of hope and redemption, heralding the coming of the Messiah. We pour out this cup, inviting Elijah to join our Seder and eagerly anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises. Just as Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, may we confront the forces of injustice and oppression in our world today. May the spirit of Elijah inspire us to work for justice, righteousness, and peace. The door is open as a sign of our faith expecting Elijah's return as one of the two witnesses described in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 13, who will help bring many Jews to faith in Jesus Christ in the last days. Some will leave an empty seat at the table known as Elijah's chair. This symbolic empty chair is set at the Seder table for the prophet Elijah, who is prophesied to herald the arrival of the Messiah, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, in Revelation 11, 3 through 6. Let us now sing together, welcoming the future return of Elijah and expressing our hope in Jesus' second coming. Jesus wanted his disciples, and he wants us to understand his life, ministry, and in particular, his death in terms of the Passover. His suffering and sacrifice are given powerful meaning found within the symbolism of the Passover feast. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? The first Passover meal occurred in 1446 B.C. While well, the Last Supper described in Matthew 26 took place between 30 to 33 AD, nearly 1,480 years after the first Passover. Jesus observed the Passover meal with his Jewish disciples, following God the Father's command. We continue this tradition over 2,000 years later. As we delve into the Last Supper, we'll uncover the significance of this extraordinary Passover meal. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 18 through 23, Jesus instructs his disciples to prepare for the Passover. As they gather to eat, Jesus reveals that one of them will betray him. The disciples, troubled, question if they could be the one. 
Jesus identifies the betrayer as the one who shares the dish with him, indicating Judas's close proximity at the table. The act of sharing the bitter herb juice, akin to marrer, symbolizes Judah's betrayal, aligning with the bitterness represented in the marrer. The narrative unfolds further in verses 24 through 25, where Jesus foretells his destiny and condemns the betrayer. Judas, feigning innocence, questions Jesus, who confirms his fate. Then in a moment of profound significance, Jesus introduces a new element to the Passover tradition. In verse 26, he takes bread, gives thanks, breaks it, and shares it with his disciples, declaring it to be his body. We will do the same. We will take the matzah bread, and we will break it, and we will distribute it to those who are gathered with us today. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Let us also partake of the body of Christ together. Partaking of the fifth cup, the blood of Christ, we're going to go ahead and pour out some more wine or juice into everyone's cups. He then took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us partake of the blood of Christ together, reclining as we do. What Jesus initiated here is unprecedented. It diverges from the traditional Passover meal. What Jesus introduced here would have been staggering to his disciples, drastically altering their understanding of the Passover meal that they have observed since childhood. This concept of his body being represented by bread and his blood by wine would have been revolutionary, reshaping their perception of the ceremony's significance. So profound was this revelation that following the meal, the disciples found themselves overwhelmed and perhaps unable to fully grasp its magnitude as evidenced by their subsequent slumber in the Garden of Gethsemane. Similarly, our observance today includes a new element. We have consumed from five cups, partaking of the customary four cups alongside communion as the fifth. In partaking of the fifth cup, we are doing it in remembrance of Christ and his blood applied to our lives. Just as the disciples were invited to partake of the fifth cup, representing Jesus' blood, we too are invited to share in the new covenant established through Christ's sacrifice. Jesus told his disciples, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. John 6, 53. As we drink from the cup, symbolizing his blood, we acknowledge the profound impact that his sacrifice has on our lives, offering us forgiveness, redemption, and eternal life. The significance of the number five, represented by the fifth cup we have consumed, carries profound symbolism. In Hebrew numerology, five symbolizes grace, reflecting Jesus as the embodiment of grace itself. The Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.14 In the New Covenant, Jesus fulfills the Passover, reinterpreting its elements in the form of the Lord's Supper. The bread symbolizes his body, and the wine represents his blood. Hence, when Christians observe the Lord's Supper, they honor the eternal Passover commanded by God. Communion is a vital act of worship, meant to be observed whenever believers gather. 
It can be shared within the family unit as every believer is a part of the royal priesthood. Just as a Seder meal is traditionally led by the head of the household, our participation reflects the priesthood we have been appointed to in Christ. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 1 Peter 2, 9. At the cross, God transferred our sicknesses and diseases onto Jesus' originally perfect body, granting us divine health. Through his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5 and 1 Peter 2, 24. In Luke 22, 20, Jesus introduces the cup as the new covenant in my blood, bringing forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1, 14 and Ephesians 1, 7. Communion is not restricted to monthly observance, but is a continual remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. It declares victory. It declares wholeness and total forgiveness. It is worship, expressing the immeasurable worth of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 26. In the Old Testament, whenever the children of Israel sacrificed a lamb for a burnt offering as they faced a strong enemy, they knew that the victory was theirs. We see an example of this in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, when the Philistines were coming against them. The prophet Samuel offered a lamb as a burnt offering. Every time something bad happened to the children of Israel, by offering a lamb sacrifice, they were proclaiming the Lord's death and the battle would turn in their favor. Similarly, by partaking in the Lord's Supper, we proclaim his death and we emerge victorious. Every time you partake of the bread and wine, you declare to the principalities and powers of darkness that the Lord's death avails for you. Every time you partake in communion, you are saying that because Jesus has been judged and punished in my place, I cannot be judged and punished. And because he conquered death and stripped the devil of his powers, I will not be defeated. The victory is already mine. That is why the psalmist David declared, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Psalm 23, 5. The Lord's table is set for you even amid opposition because as you partake of the bread and wine, you will see your enemies tremble and scatter. By proclaiming the Lord's death through holy communion, you remind the devil and his forces of their decisive defeat at Calvary's cross, Colossians 2.15. Amen. Following the conclusion of the Lord's Supper, Jesus and his disciples harmoniously lifted their voices in a hymn, Matthew 26.30. This act echoed the rich tradition of Seder meals, where songs and heartfelt expressions of hope for the redemption of Israel and all humanity would gracefully punctuate the evening's proceedings. As Jesus and his disciples concluded the Lord's Supper with the hymn, let us conclude our Passover celebration in song, affirming the victory secured through Christ's sacrifice. Thank you for partaking in this Passover Seder meal with us here at Acts 433 Church. What a delight it has been to be with you today celebrating Passover. So may you have a blessed day. May you declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen.